why the Federal Reserve has no control over the markets. Now, I know that's a big statement. We're all waiting on every word from the Federal Reserve. Are they going to lower rates? Are they going to increase rates? Will they stimulate the markets or will they continue to hike and cause the markets to crash? But today's guest says that the Federal Reserve has actually no control over the markets. It's completely out of their control. And he's not just nobody. He's one of the most respected voices when it comes to the US dollar and the bigger problem, which is the Euro dollar. I'm talking about Jeff Snyder from Euro Dollar University podcast. He's also with Markets Insider Pro and PortfolioShield.net. And we talk about why he says the Federal Reserve has no control over the markets, why the story of Paul Volcker under Reagan hiking interest rates to over 20% to tame inflation is a complete myth, how it had nothing to do with that. We're going to talk about the reality of inflation and the Fed having no control to affect that. We're going to talk about what the end game of all this is, what he thinks happens uh, in his best guess, of course. We're going to talk about sound money. We're going to talk about Bitcoin. We're going to talk about uh, reasons why it may or may not work, uh, what happened throughout history, so many more topics with the absolute legend, Jeff Snyder. It was an amazing interview. Let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Jeff, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, your patience, and I appreciate you showing up today. Uh, big fan of your work. I'm, I'm excited to dig in here. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me on. I love the set. It looks ter uh, absolutely terrific. Ah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's my first, you're my first guest with the new set here. So um, uh, I guess about a month ago, we were both speaking at a mutual friends conference, George Gammon's conference, Rebel Capitalist Live. And you gave a great presentation. I took a lot of notes. Um, and so I've been excited to talk to you ever since. And um, the thing that you were talking about, and I think that you're a little bit mad about, and you want to <laughs> scream to the whole world about, is that the Federal Reserve has no control. Is that right? Yeah. If you want to boil it down into a single idea, that's probably the, the best way to describe it. So the Federal Reserve is, uh, I think, at, at the time of this recording, which, uh, by the way, is uh, July 26. I think that tomorrow they're expected to come up with another rate hike. The markets are betting it's going to be 0.75. Some people think yeah. it'll be, a, be one point. Probably doesn't really matter either way. It seems that since they've announced their rate hikes in November of last year, the risk on assets sold off first. We saw the NASDAQ and Bitcoin kind of sold off the same day. S&P lagged. Um, it seems like their rate hikes have caused a lot of problems in the markets, but yet they have no control. So maybe kind of frame that up for us a little bit. Yeah. And I think that's the issue is, is what control do they have? Or control is probably not the right word. It's more of like uh, more like along the lines of influence. And so if we look at what the Fed actually does, let's just let's just get it out of the way from the beginning. They don't print money. There is no money printing. They create balance sheet space. They create bank reserves. But many people believe they print money. And as long as people believe they print money, they act as if they have. And one of the ways that that manifests is in the financial services industry and in certain asset markets, for example, in 2020, when Jay Powell got on TV and told you he lied to your damn face and said that he printed digital dollars and flooded the world with them. That was a message he intended to send to asset managers to say, I've got your back. Don't worry about it. No matter what's going on in these dark, dark times of COVID, the Federal Reserve has got your back. Now, if it doesn't have your back, but if enough people actually believe it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so risk managers buy risky assets because they think, well, hell, Jay Powell is doing something. I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something. So therefore, I have I can call my clients and tell them we're buying stocks or we're buying risky assets because the Fed is doing some stuff. And so that's what happens. The Fed, the Fed has a sentimental effect or a psychological effect, primarily through the financial services industry, but also in other places. And then you get to November of 2021, where the Fed says, we're not going to do the same stuff we've been doing before. Suddenly, financial services managers, they don't have that protection. They don't believe they have the same protection from Jay Powell. So you have that sentimental effect start to reverse. And it becomes self-fulfilling and self-realizing in the other in the opposite direction and the, the from the way that it had gone in 2020 and 2021. So without the, the ability to, to feel like Jay Powell has got your back because 
They're going to be hiking interest rates and they're going to be cutting back and scale it and running off their balance sheet. They're, the Fed isn't, isn't my buddy anymore. Suddenly, ask, uh, assets look a lot, lot more risky than they had before. So this is one area where um, I have a little bit of a disagreement with um, uh, a lot of economists um, because I think they can be factually correct, but maybe a little intellectually dishonest. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. So um, we talk about um, they didn't really do anything, but they had a psychological effect. Well, that is something. <laughs> uh, right. So then, then it's like you're starting to split hairs. Um, at George's last event, he had uh, Professor, uh, 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 I'm drawing a blank now, uh, the, the German uh, uh, economist who does all the talks, all the central bank stuff. Uh, is it Wolf? Anyway, I'm drawing a blank. Sorry. But he gave this great talk about how all this uh, central bank printing through 2008 and 2020 wasn't inflationary. But I said, but stock indexes are up at all-time highs and and house prices are at all-time highs. Well, that's assets. That's assets. That's not consumer prices. And so it's like it's kind of like splitting hairs a little bit to me. No, but there is a real monetary issue there. And the real monetary issue is that the credit creation that underpinned or supported the previous housing bubble and the credit bubbles of the pre-crisis era just disappeared. So what happened in asset prices post-crisis was, I mean, you can call it inflation if you want, I don't really care. There was definitely an effect there, but it was non-monetary. It was something else entirely. So the real economy has been deprived of credit and money, even if asset prices have done really well. Certain asset classes have obviously done better than others, which has only led to more problems because you have stocks, for example, at all-time highs, or they were at all-time highs not that long ago, while the economy is in the toilet, and not just in the U.S., all across the world. The economic growth has fallen off substantially, not coincidentally, ever since this credit, credit machine broke down more than a dozen years ago. So you have the psychological impact where there is less friction for psychology to work in certain asset classes and asset prices, all based on a misconception of what it, what it is the Federal Reserve does. So it's not really splitting, splitting hairs. It's a categorical difference that explains a lot about, explains everything about the world that we're actually living in, why everybody is so damn pissed off about everything, because you have the rich people getting richer and the poor people can't find a job. And that's really the issue here is that uh, without monetary growth, without credit growth, the economy's stuck. And no matter what the Federal Reserve has done over the last 12 years, and it's not just the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan has been doing it, has been failing even longer with their psychological manipulation tactics. It hasn't worked there either. So you have a, di a divergence between what the real economy is doing because psychology doesn't work in, a, in any, any real sense. It does work in asset markets like stocks because there's no real fundamental tie to any tangible asset or intangible outcome. So again, you have this major divergence between where assets went and where the real economy went, which is nowhere good. Well, let's let's and let me talk about one other thing. So you said that they don't actually print money, which is true. So the Federal Reserve gives banks reserves and they set the interest rate, but the bank charges their interest rate on top of that, whatever they want, and they can decide whether they want to loan money out or not, right? So I think that's kind of your point, right? However, um, through the bank's reserves and through their MBS policies and stuff, they take toxic debt off the books and then replace, no? No. See, that's the thing. That's another misconception. Okay, so Fed explain was that. not buying. I mean, the Fed buys U.S. Treasuries and MBS, and then they're not buying subprime mortgages. They're not buying subprime mortgage bonds or leveraged loans or some other financial product. They're certainly not buying CLOs like they made people believe either in March of 2020. The Fed is buying assets the market already wants. In fact, the Fed knows this. They talk about it all the time. The fact that, you know, famous quote from Richard Fisher in 2011, why are we buying assets that the market is fleeing toward? Central banks are supposed to be buying, like you said, they're supposed to be buying toxic assets that people don't want, but that's not what quantitative easing has been. It's not what quantitative easing has ever been, which is one reason why it doesn't ever work. And really, you know, when we stop and think about what QE is supposed to be as, and, as opposed to what it actually is, everybody looks at it from the perspective of the Federal Reserve. What is the Fed doing? When you need to look at it, as you just said, Mark, from the perspective of the commercial bank, you can create all the reserves in the world that you want, but if banks aren't going to be lending, it doesn't matter. That's just an accounting fiction that's created by monetary policy. Think about it this way. 
Before, before Lehman Brothers in 2008, there were hardly any bank reserves in the, in the entire global system that spans trillions upon trillions of dollars. There were no bank reserves. Yet credit was created. We had asset bubbles through the roof. You had all sorts of money everywhere around the world with no bank reserves. Suddenly, we get to the other side of the crisis. There are trillions in bank reserves, but no credit growth, no expansion, no money. How is that possible? Because the Fed isn't creating usable money. It's responding to breakdowns in the actual monetary system through this psychological tactic, through the, uh, through the act of buying bonds that the market already wants anyway. So the way that you were explaining to me, though, it sounds like there's direct and indirect influence the Fed has. So a lot of times I think maybe you're saying that, so look, they, they didn't do anything. They said they were going to do something, but they didn't do anything. So there was no result. But at the same time, just them saying it, or sometimes we might call it job owning, actually does do something. Would we agree on that? It can, yes. And, and most of those psychological impacts or sentimental impacts are short term in nature. They don't have a lasting impact, certainly in any real sense. Uh, asset price is a different thing. Uh, certain asset markets is, is a different story. But in terms of the real economy, there's really not much impact whatsoever. Okay. Now, um, another thing that you had talked about at this, uh, at this event, uh, the Rebel Capitalist Live, you talked about the Volcker myth. And so everyone is wondering now if the Fed can, uh, if they'll have the stomach to tame inflation, will they raise rates high enough to stomach, you know, to, to, to finally put an end to this high inflation that we have, um, like Volcker did in the 80s, where he went from 10 to 20 percent. Um, and you had a whole piece saying that that was a complete myth, which continues to back up what you're saying of why the Federal Reserve really has no controls. So let's talk about that Volcker myth and why you think that actually isn't true. He isn't the one that stopped inflation. If, if I'm saying that right, if I'm not putting words in your mouth. Yeah, that's where the Volcker myth actually comes from. The idea that it was Paul Volcker who skyrocketed interest rates in 70, starting in 1979. And that's the reason why the great inflation suddenly stopped. And the funny thing is, if you, had tra if you time travel back to 1979, he would be shocked. And by he, I mean Paul Volcker. They had no idea what they were doing in 79. And this is not something you have to take my word for it. All I got to do is read the transcript from the FOMC meetings at the time. These people had no clue what they were doing. And the idea that Paul Volcker raising rates, that's not what he did either. But the, the, the idea, the myth that he raised rates and tamed great inflation uh, has, is, was something that was invented afterward to try and explain what happened in late, in the, from the late 70s into the middle 1980s. It was sort of like we have no idea what really happened. So maybe it was this thing that Volcker did that created this, the, the end of the great inflation. And that's been the myth that we've been told that was reinforced through the quote unquote great moderation by Alan Greenspan, the maestro, all that stuff in the 90s and into the 2000s. But if you actually go back and look at what happened in the late 70s and early 1980s, it was a whole bunch of clueless bureaucrats just throwing shit at the wall, hoping something <laughs> stuck. So why did he raise rates so high? Because they didn't know what else to do. Paul Volcker, you got to give the guy at least some credit. Unlike his predecessor, Arthur Burns, Volcker at least knew that the great inflation was tied to the money supply. Burns thought it was fiscal deficits. He convinced governments. He went off into a neo-Keynesian funk. And so, you know, the Federal Reserve was looking in the wrong place for the reason why inflation was so out of control. As Milton Friedman said, as Milton Friedman showed conclusively, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So at least Volcker, Volcker at least knew that much. However, his plan to stop inflation was sort of a, we don't know what else to do because the Federal Reserve, all we have in our toolkit are these bank reserves. And bank reserves have a very narrow limited use, which is you have a reserve requirement that's imposed upon the banking system by governments. And so what happened, what the theory was, was that if the Federal Reserve under Volcker made bank reserves scarce, he would make bank reserves expensive. And if bank, if bank reserves became expensive, that would make depository money expensive because if you're a commercial bank and you create a loan and a, and a corresponding deposit money uh, liability against it, that creates a reserve requirement that you must meet. And you, have to, you can meet it through vault cash or you can meet it through bank reserves held at the Fed. So the idea was if we make bank reserves scarce, that'll, make, that'll increase the cost. The rate will go up as it did. The federal funds rate will go up. And that will, that will then make banks reconsider their creation of loans and depository money, therefore restrict economic activity, and that's the end of the inflation. And that's not how it worked. 
First of all, the Federal Reserve panicked as soon as they started this this uh, restricting reserve regime in 1979. Immediately, the federal funds rate skyrocketed to more than 15 percent, which nowadays people think, well, yeah, that was the point. But no, at the time they panicked. Mm. They actually did re uh, repo programs starting in October of 1979 to put reserves back into the system because they thought they had gone too far. But either way, it didn't matter because no matter what the Federal Reserve did in terms of depriving the system or not depriving the system of bank reserves, it had no impact whatsoever on depository money. It had no impact on M3. It had no impact on the real money, which is the shadow money across the euro dollar system. That's not what happened. So after it became clear that restricting bank reserves was having no effect on either monetary aggregates or the real economic outcomes, they sort of invented another kind of myth, which was that, okay, maybe restricting bank reserves didn't cause the end, the end of the Great Reflation. Maybe it was the collateral consequence of having interest rates rise, the federal funds rate rise, that had some kind of impact that we can't explain because it didn't have any kind of monetary impact. It didn't impact the monetary system whatsoever. So maybe the fact that interest rates, short-term federal funds rate in particular, went up, that's the reason why the economic outcomes that we all wanted ended up happening. It's simply looking at correlation and, in, and implying causation that isn't actually there because, again, the Fed at the time realized they couldn't even define, let alone measure, let alone control the monetary system. Now, uh, let's jump, I, I want to talk about where we're at today, but before we jump to there, um, and I guess the, the part of the reason why you say they can't really control the monetary system is that the Fed only can control basically the dollars. Bank reserves, that's it. That's the, that's the one tool that they have. And in the 1970s, before the 1970s, banks invented ways to circumvent the reserve requirements. They invented new ways of doing monetary uh, transactions, things like repo, things like euro dollars, things like currency swaps that they could just manipulate both the asset and liability side regardless of whatever constraints the Fed tried to impose on them. And in fact, that's one of the things that happened in 1979 and 1980. The Fed tried to make these reserves expensive, therefore making depository money expensive. And so banks just encouraged their customers to shift their assets from their deposit accounts into money market funds. Money market funds don't have a reserve requirements, and so they went into. So as the customer deposits moved from the commercial bank that that created this reserve requirement, they moved to a money market fund. The bank would then just borrow the funds back from the money market fund in wholesale markets. Banks had created all sorts of ways to be able to manipulate their assets and liability. These monetary forms that just rendered the Federal Reserve's tools completely obsolete. Except for if they don't believe the Fed's going to be behind them supporting them, then they'll get, in, uh, they'll get out of those risky assets, which is where we're at today. Which is a completely different animal. It's a different animal. So the tools yeah. that their Fed is using don't really do much, but the support, that the, the psychological effect of the support, either having it or not having it, does have an effect. In, yeah, in certain markets. It certainly doesn't have any impact in anything that has a fundamental link to the real economy. So fixed income, you don't see any real psychological impact from the Fed whatsoever. It's really about manipulating the short end of the yield curve and hoping the rest of the curve goes along. So we've seen the Fed hike rates over the last few months. The short end of the yield curve goes up because, of course, it would. If you're owning a two-year U.S. Treasury, for example, if the Fed is hiking its, you know, the ver reverse repo rate, you have an alternative rate that you can get a return on. So the Fed is able to influence the short end of the yield curve. But even that is somewhat illusory because over time, they lose control really, really quickly too. And that's, that's assuming that the long end of the yield curve actually falls in line, which as we see now, that's not the case either. That's why the curves are inverted because the long end of the yield curve is fighting against the Fed's rate hikes at the short end. Hmm. Yeah. Now, um, the, the yield curve has gotten pretty screwed up. I mean, a lot of this, I would imagine, has to do with the continued manipulation they have with printing more currency and manipulating the, the, their Fed funds rate at some point. Because it's been accurate at predicting uh, recessions, which I guess per the per the White House, we're not in a recession anymore, technically. <laughs> they, they've changed. That's true, but the, the recession's still coming. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the yield curve is predicting that there's a recession coming. And it's been predicting that for a while, yeah. right? Their yield curve was predicting that since 2019. 
while the yield curve predicted the recession that probably would have happened in 2020 had it not been for COVID. So the yield curve had inverted in 2019. In fact, parts of it inverted as early as 2018. Euro dollar futures curve inverted in June of 2018, which was a bet that the Fed was going to end up cutting rates before they continued hiking rates, which is actually proven to be true. These markets have been have proven in, in general terms, incredibly accurate over each of these particular cycles. And so the Euro dollar futures curve inverted back in December of last year, which was a bet despite the Fed's ultra hawkish stance and growing ultra hawkish stance that eventually the Fed was going to have to stop hiking rates and maybe start to turn around and start cutting them before the Fed realized it. And ever since December, that inversion Euro dollar futures has grown to 2008 proportions. Mm. Uh, it is incredibly inverted at the as we speak right now which is the market betting that the Fed only has a couple, maybe more rate hikes left this year before something happens. We don't know what, we can guess, before something happens and the Fed has to turn around, stop hiking rates and turn around and start cutting them aggressively, maybe as soon as this year, probably next, early next year at the latest. And then the yield curve is essentially agreeing with the premise behind the Euro dollar futures inversion, which is that there's probably something like recession, if not nasty recession, still in front of us. So think about it that way. We've already had two straight quarters, likely, we'll find out Thursday, but we'll likely have had two straight quarters of negative GDP to start the year. And the markets are all uniformly saying that's not the thing we're worried about. Mm. We're worried about what comes after we've already had a technical recession, assuming you believe that that's the definition. So the markets are all positioned for a deflationary monetary condition on top of what might be a pretty nasty recession too. When you go back and, and look through history, which I know you have many times, um, it seems like it's not the um, it's not the reversal. So when they've been lowering, 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 and then they go back to raising, which they're on right now, it's when they reverse back off of that, which is, seems to be kind of the trigger. Is that kind of what you're saying? The markets are kind of seeing that in in the in the forefront. And that's the trigger that they're well, afraid of? Well, in some of? ways, the, the long, longer of these curves are simply ignoring the Fed entirely. What the, you know, Irving Fisher's decomposition of yields into growth and inflation expectations. A long, year, a long end treasury yield is essentially building upon the short end interest rates, so the money alternatives, but then implying growth and inflation expectations on top of them. And so what the, what the curves are telling us, and they have been telling us all year, is they disagree with the very premise behind the Fed's rate hikes to begin with that the economy is not overheating, the labor market is not in any great situation, and that the, the rate hikes to quote unquote end inflation aren't necessary because the recession that the market is afraid of is the instrument that will end inflation, that will end consumer prices. And it will likely result in a, a renewed disinflation, if not deflation, at least in the intermediate term. So the markets, especially along into the yield curves outside of the Fed's window, same thing with euro dollar futures, the, the markets have been betting against rate hikes from the very beginning. Hmm. Now, uh, I want to get into this end game, the few hikes before it breaks. You said we can guess at what breaks, and we'll, we'll get back to that. But um, you had also talked about how really what we have is a problem um, that, that signals these, uh, these crashes, these recessions, is these dollar shortages that happen all over the world. And I think that's pro probably where we're at yeah, right now. We have a dollar shortage right now, which is why the Dixie's shooting so high. So explain this dollar shortage over right. the world to us. That's the hardest part for people to come to terms with because, as you said, Mark, I mean, you see the Fed's balance sheet go up. You see there's trillions upon trillions of bank reserves, and you assume that bank reserves are useful money. In fact, some people call them base money. And if you see the Fed's balance sheet skyrocket, you see all of these trillions of reserves suddenly appear out of thin air, you think a lot of money has been printed. So how in the world can we possibly have a dollar shortage when the Fed has created all these dollars? And the answer is simply when you realize that bank reserves are not useful money and the Fed is simply create, they're just a byproduct of quantitative easing, um, then you can, okay, the Fed isn't part of the monetary system. Bank reserves are not really useful money. What actually is useful money is telling you that there is nothing, there's a dollar shortage and it's getting worse and worse all the time. And we see this in any number of ways. Um, we don't have any direct insight into the uh, euro dollar system as a whole, 
But these markets, these curves, you know, the treasury market, German global bond markets, um, the dollar's exchange value, it's a good one too. When the dollar's exchange values goes up, that's a bellwether for global financial conditions in US dollars. It's telling you there are not enough dollars. The price of participating in the global monetary system has gone way up because there aren't enough of them available to be used around the world. So we see all of these signals from the monetary system itself telling us there must be a, not a dollar shortage, but a, a, not just a dollar shortage, but a growing and a more severe one as we go through this year. That's why these curves are so distorted, so inverted, because the markets aren't just thinking about recession, they're thinking about what happens when you have a recession plus a possible deflationary breakdown in terms of another monetary uh, event, like maybe March of 2020, uh, maybe something on the lines, not in the same way, but something similar to the 2008 crisis. Well, you won't, we're not going to see banks failure. We're not going to see bank failures and banks fail like they did in 2008. But that doesn't mean we can't have a liquidity squeeze or a deflationary monetary event of similar type of proportions. So the markets are worried about this already. They're telling you from inside the monetary system that there are not enough dollars around the world. And it has nothing to do with the Fed. It's all about the monetary system itself. Now, when you say the bank, the, the Fed gave bank reserves, which is not useful money, um, does it give them confidence? Is that an indirect benefit to the market? Does it give the banks confidence to loan more money out? It doesn't. I mean, it, it does for portfolio managers looking to buy stocks. It has absolutely no effect whatsoever on the actual banking system and credit creation. And this is, you know, quantitative easing is the most empirically tested program maybe in human history. It's been used over and over and over again, and the, the results are uniformly the same. They're just not what you hear on, on mainstream media. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Just read the academic scholarship that's been written by the QE people themselves. Um, Bank of Japan, a number of studies that have shown quantitative easing has no effect in any of the three proposed channels that it's supposed to. The Federal Reserve studies, the same thing. The last study, I think, from the Fed, um, or maybe it was a, a researcher associated with the Fed, I forget, uh, just going off the top of my head, they said that a $600 billion QE program that targeted specifically U.S. Treasury buying, would we maybe should expect about 15 basis points of effect on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. Think about that. $600 billion in Treasury buying lowers the 10-year Treasury yield by 15 basis points? That's basically a rounding error if it's statistically significant at all. So what I'm saying is that quantitative easing has no effect on the real economy because it has no effect on banks. The banking system is constrained by its own uh, internal as well as external parameters that have been, doesn't matter what the Fed does. There's no, no amount of jawboning or psychological manipulation or you know the Fed being your best friend because it's buying bonds has been able to get banks in the US, in Europe, in Japan for 30 years out of the same rut. Credit creation does not correspond to bank reserves or Federal Reserve policies, which is the very lesson that Paul Volcker learned 40 years ago. Bank reserves just don't core. If banks want to do something, it doesn't matter if they have reserves or not. They'll create the liquidity to do it. It's really about the commercial banking system. So, um, so if, if quantitative easing isn't inflationary, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, um, I understand the academic and, and factually correct argument, but then like, what does it mean to the average person? And so like, uh, how do we see this? So since 2008, we've had massive QE for the last decade or a dozen years, and we've seen stock markets and, and real estate go to all time highs. And so even if that hasn't affected the commercial banks to create more money, um, has it led into a wealth effect where my stock account, my retirement account's higher, my house is higher, I spend more money that's inflationary. Today we're seeing the opposite of that. Even though they haven't really done anything, people feel less wealthy today, they're spending less money. So if we, if we, if we, if we don't look at just the purely, you know, uh, like I said, uh, effects, uh, or if we take the total effects together, I mean, is there some causation or correlation there? There should be, and that's one of the theoretical channels for quantitative easing, and that's one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve and all central banks pay attention to the stock markets, because they believe they can manipulate stocks, and they're correct about that, into creating, as you said, Mark, the wealth effect. Mm -hmm. But there's no correlation between the stock prices and actual spending in any, in any economy. It's simply a theoretical uh, idea. You talk about academics. The wealth effect is, is more of an economic idea than any real phenomenon. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. And of course, why would there be? 
Just because that uh, your your four hundred one k goes up, you can't spend a four hundred one k until you actually retire. Yeah, but look at now. You might think, well, my four hundred one k is up, so I can spend other money because I don't have to save it. But that doesn't happen. It, there's no evidence. There's no data that shows it. And first, and more than that, the economic growth since two thousand eight, since since the Fed started on quantitative easing, has been materially different than it had been before the pre crisis. And by being materially different, I mean much much worse. So if there is a wealth effect, then it is it is not only undetectable, it's led us into a worse situation than we would have been had nothing happened in 2008. Mm. I, I don't know if I agree with that. And, and some of it is just gut, right? So like myself included, like I'm not going to retire for a long time. But right now, the way the markets are right now, like I'm second guessing vacations. I'm second guessing added on to my house like I was going to. Because like, ooh, we, like you said, the yield curve showing there could be something there. I'm spending less money. So how do we measure that? I don't know. But I do know there is some measurement. So for example, we saw last year, we saw record amounts of job quits record amounts. And we broke it month after month. And why were those people quitting jobs? Well, a lot of polls showed they were going to trade options on Robinhood <laughs> and trade cryptocurrencies. <laughs> and so that yeah, that did cause a wealth effect. And that was measurable, right? And that's an anecdote. It's not nationally data. Okay. Um, yes, there were, you know, the, the, the sad fact of the matter is the labor market is not as robust as it would seem from that metric. Because according to the establishment survey or any of the survey, the, the labor market da data, um, we have fewer jobs today than we did in February of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so you can blame that on the great resignation, so-called great resignation, but it also could be, and I think it is, consistent with what markets are telling us, not stock markets, but other markets are telling us that there was no wealth effect and that we're picking and choosing anecdotes that fit preconceived narratives. The idea that the Fed created this bubble when the Fed really didn't do much of anything. Uh, the real economy suffered for the 2020 breakdown. I mean, of course it did. We put how many small businesses out of work or out of business in 2020? Did we really think that we were going to have a robust recovery from that? Just on that alone. Um, and so that's what the markets are telling us. And that's what the data tells us with the fact that we have fewer jobs. The participation rate took another leg down. These are similar types of, of results that we saw in the aftermath of the first financial crisis in 2009 and 2010. So what we're seeing is that th that process is being repeated for the second time. And so some of these other ancillary anecdotes are just inconsistent or seemingly inconsistent with the data, which tells us there was no wealth effect. There's no widespread wealth effect. It certainly had an effect on certain, uh, certain uh, proportions of the population, but that wasn't enough to create an overall environment that was actually consistent with a booming economy. Yeah, I know with these complex systems, it's it's hard to like pull things out. But like, say, let's say for example, supply chains have been overtaxed, and we've had massive supply chain problems. Everybody knows that. Now, why? Well, there's a there's a trillion reasons why. But one of the reasons why is excess demand, and one of them is not enough product, right? So supply chains broke down, COVID shut them down, open, turn them back on, et cetera. People quit. There's all that. But I, I looked at some data that showed that our imports had were 20 percent more than they were previously on average. So we were buying more stuff. We were ordering more stuff. I know people in industries, um, have, are, there, there's record sales in outdoor equipment and products and things like that. So yep. um, there were record amounts of buying. Uh, we did order more stuff, which overtaxed the supply demand equation of the or equilibrium of the supply chain. So there was some of that. You, we can't quantify that? No, we can. But that's a, that was a reallocation of resources because Americans were locked in their homes. They went nuts spending money on Amazon which meant we were buying goods from overseas producers that only made things worse because we couldn't move goods around. As you said, Mark, there was supply bottlenecks and things like that. But what people don't realize is that as Americans were spending goods in record amounts, that's absolutely true, in record amounts on goods, they were not spending on services. So the goods economy made it seem like everything was terrific, if not overheating, but then you look at services, that forgotten as the forgotten part of the whole thing because it's not sexy, because it wasn't exciting. We've spent less on services over the last couple of years than, than and, and before. We're, in real terms, the spending on services is still not back where it was before the COVID crisis. Mm. Let me say that again. 
we're, two years later, we're spending less on services than we did before the, uh, before the recession in 2020. So if you look only at goods, and you look only at the prices of goods, it looks like the economy went completely crazy, because it did. It was insane in that one part of the economy. But the rest of the economy, which explains why job creation hasn't been as robust as some of the numbers make it seem, is because the whole economy, the entire system as a whole, didn't really recover. So what happened in 2020 and 2021, as the demand curve was artificially shifted to the right, it was only artificially shifted to the right for part of the economy. And so that created the imbalance, a reallocation imbalance that led to consumer prices going up and oil prices, gasoline, everything else that you just mentioned. That exacerbated supply problems uh, from the pandemic and everything else, shipments, logistical issues all over the economy but it didn't address the, the lack of spending, the really seriously serious and alarming lack of spending on the services side. So if you looked at those combined in aggregate, uh, we didn't actually increase that much. It would just shifted from- No, if you actually draw, Mark, if you draw a line from you know, where services or where personal consumption expenditures as a whole, goods and services together would have been, had there been no, great re, uh, no COVID recession, that's right where we are right mm -hmm. now. So essentially, all the money that was spent on goods that would have been, or all the money that would have been spent on services was just spent on goods for a while. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask you about the end game, which you had uh, alluded to. You think there's potentially a few more hikes coming before something breaks. We don't know what it is. We'll guess. And then they reverse course. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But before we jump into that, I want to talk about this uh, inelasticity of the money supply. So you talked about um, the, one of the failures of gold, specifically going into the Great Depression, was that the inelasticity of the money supply and then the need to kind of put the credit on top of that. Um, am I framing that up correctly? Yeah, what we've seen throughout history was that inelastic money supplies always led to periods of hoarding. Well, first you got risk taking, bubble type behavior that eventually leads to hoarding with no ability to have elastic money supply that causes bank panics, destruction, economic destruction, demand destruction, deflation, and then depression. That happened repeatedly throughout history when, whenever we got into these, uh, these deflationary periods. And that's the reason why many countries turned to central banks, hoping that a public utility could provide an element of elasticity. Of course, that, that didn't prove to work very well. Certainly in the Great Depression with the, uh, you know, the, the brand new Federal Reserve, you know, only 15 years into its history and it leads to the worst economic calamity in history. So that didn't really settle the elasticity question either, but that's still, it's, we, in a fixed money or hard money system, we always have this defect where it leads to pooling and hoarding that produces some of the worst economic consequences. Well, it seems, though, to me is that um, it's one, I would say booms and busts are a natural part of the world, right? We have seasons in life and we, we're, we're humans. And so um, we like neon colors. And then next thing you know, they're out of fashion and we just want white and black, for example, right? And people made too many of the neon clothes and then fidget spinners are popular and then people bought too many fidget spinners and like it just happens, right? So there's like natural cycles. And it seems like it's the creation of the money supply that creates this this artificial boom, and then it's the restriction of the supply not continuing to grow at the same pace, almost like a Ponzi scheme, that then seems to crash it. And so maybe on a hard money system, we would still have booms and busts, which we've seen throughout hundreds of years of history, but those booms and busts are small in comparison to the ever-growing booms and busts that we have now under these artificially stimulated bubbles. Yeah, I don't, that's a tough question. It's, in, some, in some ways, it's a counterfactual because you can't go back and redo historical depressions and see how it worked out under, under different circumstances. But as you said, Mark, the, the, there is a, an, an innate human boom and bust cycle built within us. And I don't think we'll ever, uh, ever solve that problem because there is no way to solve that problem unless humans can start working from perfect future information, unless we do get crystal balls where we can tell the future. There's always going to be, as you said, there's always going to be sick cycles in fashion. There's going to be cycles in building. Uh, there's going to be too much risk taking, mm -hmm. whatever. And I think and I fear most people nowadays have confused and conflated inelasticity or elasticity with something like too big to fail, which is, you know, sort of the quasi haphazard program that Ben Bernanke's Fed tried to put together in the wake of the first financial crisis. That's not elasticity. That was something else entirely. Elasticity is that when we go into a bust cycle, 
that we don't end up with a monetary shortage that then produces deflation. You can still have a bus cycle without the deflation that leads to the necessary um, uh, creative destruction, as Schumpeter mm -hmm. called it. We still want that to happen. We still want bad banks that have bad ideas, that give out bad loans to bad people. We want them right. to go out of business. But what we don't want to have happen, and what does happen during these deflationary depressions, is that when bad banks go out of business, it leads to good banks going out of business and good businesses going out of business at the same time because money becomes too dear. Everybody holds on to money and there's not enough liquidity in the economy that bad banks and good banks alike end up going out of business, which harms the economy, not just in the short run, but the long run. So the idea behind elasticity, the real idea behind elasticity, not too big to fail, is that we sort the good from the bad. And the only way to do that is to make sure the good, good firms and good banks have enough money, have enough liquidity available that they can survive any bust cycle. That's what Walter Badgett was talking about in the 19th century from the Bank of England. You know, you lend freely at high rates on good collateral. That was, that was, the, that was the central bank dictum of elasticity in currency. Now, central banks nowadays don't do that because they can't. They can't even define elasticity or they can't even define liquidity, let alone create elasticity. But still, that's the idea that I think that we need to be uh, come to terms with is that elasticity doesn't mean too big to fail. It means limiting the downside to only those who made big mistakes. Where would you put yourself um, from an uh, economist viewpoint, like an Austrian economist view, and then maybe the opposite being a Keynesian kind of view? Uh, where, do you, where would you say, are you somewhere in the middle? Are you, would you consider yourself Austrian, Keynesian, or how, how do you think about that? I first of all, I'm not an economist. <laughs> I'm just talking about your view. I'm talking about There's your viewpoint. That. Right? Yeah, I'm not an economist I either, but I align know, with the Austrians. Of, but I'm not an economist either. No, that's. I think being not being an economist is actually helpful because part of the problem is that you find yourself in a box. I've been accused of being a Keynesian, a monetarist, an Austrian, a Marxist, <laughs> and pretty much anything around uh, around the spectrum. I would I would like to think of myself as just a realist. Um, I started out with Austrian sympathies, hard money, gold standard, free market capitalism, and you just can't get over the history of what happens when you get into these deflationary depressions, which is the worst of the worst mm -hmm. case. So for I, you know, I disagree with most of what Keynes said about some of the uh, implications and what what government should do in the wake of deflationary crisis, but yet you can't argue with how Keynes framed as, at least the deflationary disease. He called it the worst evil there is because in a deflationary depression, the, deflation, the, the consequences of that deflationary depression fall mostly on workers. So the poorest members of society are the ones who suffer in these worst cases. So we have a very vested interest as a society and a system to make sure that we don't have deflationary depression. So if that makes me a monetarist, I don't care. If that makes me, uh, uh, certainly not an Austrian, but you know, sympathies for some of these other uh, schools and doctrines, I think most of them have, have at least some good ideas that you should listen to. But I, I really think part of the problem here is that everybody gets very rigidly doctrinaire and ideological and stops thinking about and thinking about things in terms of evidence and actual history. Yeah, just you had said that um, in you know you do believe banks should be able to fail and wash out the bad ones and create a destruction. I agree with that. But then you talked about the in, in a deflationary event that the good banks go out of business with the bad banks, and it, we just recently saw this in the crypto markets, right? Where uh, well, we saw in two thousand eight, obviously with the, with the investment banks, and then recently in the crypto markets. And a lot of it that is because of the contagion that's taken. So too much leverage built up in the system. Uh, the contagion because they're all um, you know <laughs> doing loans with each other and so when one goes down then they lose that uh, those assets and it dominoes the whole thing and so um, in a uh, it's the leverage that seems to be the problem and so in a system where we didn't have all this in, uh, in monetary inflation um, and we didn't have all this leverage that built up and we had banks that were on <laughs> full reserve for example then those banks wouldn't go out of business they wouldn't be subject to the mistakes that those. And you would never have economic growth. <laughs> be, because of the inelasticity you would of the money supply. constrain the upside. Yeah, because they're, that's the thing. I think that's the other part of this that we're forgetting is that, you know, we live in a dynamic world where demand for money is not static. Demand for money changes. And I'm talking about legitimate demand, not just speculative demand. Legit, legitimate demand rises and falls. And we're supposed to be able to, to, to uh, 
to um, get a sense of that by the you know interest rates, for example. If there's legitimate demand for money, I know legitimate is a sort of a weasel word here. It's doing a lot of work, but legitimate demand for money goes up. You know, do we really want the price of money to skyrocket because it's fixed? If there's legitimate demand for money for legitimately productive and sustainable purposes, why wouldn't we want the dynamic money supply on the supply side to be able to meet that demand for money without causing frictions and harms and inefficiencies? Mm -hmm. So if you have a fixed money system where you don't dynamically meet demand, two things happen. One thing is you'll get lack of economic growth. And the second thing is the commercial system will invent new ways of new forms of money to circumvent the hard money, uh, the hard money cap, so to speak. And this has happened throughout. I mean, the euro dollar system itself was an answer to Triffin's paradox because Triffin's paradox wasn't really a paradox. It was a simply the, the international reserve system under Bretton Woods was incapable of, re, of meeting rising global demand for money in a dynamic setting. So I don't, you know, I don't agree that um, demand for money or uh, the uh, supply of money needs to be fixed in order to make sure that we don't ever have an asset bubble. Because like I said, I think business cycles happen anyway. They're going to happen regardless of whether or not there's fixed money or not. You saw that th all throughout the 19th century on the, the best of the best, the classical gold standard. There were bubbles everywhere. It happens. It's, it's, it's a flaw in human nature, not in the monetary Right, system. and I would agree with that. They, they happen, and, and that's a problem that we see all throughout the world today. Um, for example, with the look at the rise of antidepressants use, especially in the United States, for example. Well, like, uh, you need, you know, without, we, we can't always just be happy 100% of the time. Like, we have to have pain in order to know joy, for example, right? And, uh, how, how do we know the happiest time of our life if we don't have sad times and things like that? And so uh, a lot of that... <laughs> Uh, but but jumping back, stay, staying on track here with the money supply. So um, like with Bitcoin, you, you've mentioned many times, and I've seen your interviews with uh, one of my good buddies, Robert Breedlove. Um, and you mentioned now um, Bitcoin has some superior attributes, transparency, lack of asymmetry, uh, things yep. like that. But it's the inelasticity with that because of Bitcoin, of course, has a fixed monetary supply and over more than 21 million. Then you think that leads us back into the Triffin's dilemma, a paradox kind of a thing. Um, and then back into some sort of a euro dollar or some sort of a new emergence of a credit-based system? Yeah, I think that's the primary drawback. You're right, because I think Bitcoin is an elegant uh, idea, an elegant step in, in the right direction. Because one of the problems with the euro dollar system is that it is a distributed ledger, virtual currency, digital currency technology, but it's maintained by just the banking system. And it's completely opaque. We don't really know what goes on inside of it, which has privileged the banks even that much more. An Austrian concept called Cantillian effects, which, if you're able to create money more than if you're able to create money and other, nobody else is, you get the benefits first, which of course then leads to over financialization, if not hyper financialization, which we saw in the pre-crisis era. So Bitcoin, in a lot of ways, was a step in the right direction, certainly in terms of transparency, but also in terms of just simplicity. Um, we don't need an overly complicated monetary system. In fact, we don't want an over, overly complicated monetary system because money is supposed to be a commercial tool. It's not wealth. It's not anything else. It's supposed to allow a modern capitalist free market economy to do what it does best. And that's, that's we focus on productive uses of our time. We're not hiring all sorts of accountants <laughs> yeah. and lawyers and attorneys and banks to hedge our financial risk. We should not think about money whatsoever. Right. It's one of those things you should just be in the back of your mind and you never really have to deal much, you never have to think much about it. And that's one of the problems with the system that we have is we spend so much time talking about this stuff and worrying about this stuff and, and watching it go crazy that we've kind of lost focus here on the real economy, which is what's supposed to happen. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So Bitcoin, I think, represented a, a, at least a couple of good steps in the right direction. I worry, though, that it didn't take enough of them in the right direction, and it leaves us in the same sort of inherent flaws that we had before. And again, the inelasticity problem is that, yes, we're going to have pain. We're going to have business cycles. There are going to be good times and bad times. But there really is no reason for the bad times to be so bad that it endangers the long run future, which is what we saw in the 1930s or in 1893. But we didn't see it in 1907 because there was elasticity in the banking system created by the banking system itself. So, yes, boom bust cycles will happen, but we don't need to have the worst of the worst case uh, present be presented with the worst right. of the worst case when we do get into the bust. But, part but of if the we cycle. hadn't if we hadn't built the money supply up so big, 
um, the boom wouldn't have gotten so big, wouldn't, and then it would have made the bus so fall, so bad. So if I'm walking on a one foot wall and I fall off, it's not that bad. If I'm walking on a hundred foot wall and I fall off, it's really bad. And so if we look at if we look at it from that perspective, so for example. Um, the problem that we're in today, right? So they, uh, the last couple of years and to the point you're saying, I mean, this creation of the money supply, this increase in the money supply, the Fed, Fed Treasury stimulus of the last two years, I'm not going to dig into the intricacies of that, but we saw a 30% rise in stock market, home prices have doubled, et cetera, et cetera. And so the average person, um, if they don't participate in that, they get left behind. So I'm a contractor, you know, I work on homes and let's say that, you know, I have all these jobs and it's like, well, I need to take on these additional jobs. I need to hire more employees. I need to go finance more vehicles. I need to move into a new office to keep up with that demand. Now I could choose not to, and I could just store my money to your point and not have to worry about it, which is, I agree is the way it should be. But if I play that game, I'm just going to put my money in the bank and, and ignore it. And I'm not going to scale my business to keep up with demand. Then I get left behind. So I'm forced to play that game, but then all of a sudden, <laughs> Let's just suck the money out of the system and then everything crashes. And now I'm stuck with all these trucks and these extra buildings because I had played in that game. And so um, if we didn't have this boom that I had to, I was forced to play along with and keep up and then the inevitable bust that now crushes me, um, it doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world. Now we'd still have booms and busts, but they wouldn't be so massive and I could just store my wealth. <laughs> but <laughs> under the terms that you've dictated. But yes, isn't that what's happened? Exactly isn't that true? But that's not how it, that's not what actually happened. What we actually happened was we had legitimate economic growth before the pre-crisis, before the crisis uh, showed up. Uh, yes, there were bubbles, there were imbalances in certainly U.S. real estate, but you look around most of the rest of the world, emerging markets, China, for example, backwards communist subsistence agriculture China turned into a global powerhouse, which we all benefited from, by the way. Uh, in some ways, some people more than others, obviously it was at the expense of certain parts of the US. I grew up in the Rust Belt, so I knew exactly where all those jobs went. They certainly went to China, but by and large, the, uh, the growth cycle, certainly from the 1980s forward, was a legitimate growth cycle. And you can make, I would make a strong case that it, that, wouldn't have nev that would never would have happened in a restrained fixed money system. We never would have had that growth. And so it's difficult to prove the counterfactual that hey, um, maybe we shouldn't have had that growth to begin with. I don't know. I think the world is a better place because of the globalization that certainly showed up in, from the 1950s forward. As soon as the euro dollar started really producing you know, these virtual dollars in, in, uh, in excess, that's really, I think there was a very real benefit to that. And had it not happened, the world would have looked very differently than it does today, or at least in 2008. And the problem was, not that we printed money after the crisis, is that we didn't. That we didn't fix the monetary issue in 2008. We didn't create elasticity, and that has led to a permanent change, or at least so far a permanent change, in economic growth. So that we are, over the last 15 years, we are seeing what the global economy would have looked like had it not had enough money. And it looks increasingly ugly by the year. There's a reason why we, we're, we're witnessing social, political, and economic upheaval all over the world. It's because of we're seeing what happens in, a, in, a, in an economic system that is deprived of any monetary elasticity. Well, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, upheavals that we're having around the world is also because of other bad policies, such as restricting energy use and restricting uh, food. Uh, but those are different topics for a different time. But sticking back on this topic of the inelasticity of the money supply, um, I would agree that I would think that we'd both agree that uh, we don't need money. Nobody wants money. What we want is the things that money buys us, which is back to the point we made goods and services, right? That's what an economy makes goods and services. So I don't want the money. I want the goods and services. Now I would ask uh, people typically when they say, well, doesn't the money supply always need to increase or expand? I would say, um, wouldn't you rather, and to the point that you made, which I agree with hundred percent, like a brain surgeon, the, the world, the world blew up into prosperity because of specialization, right? And now I could be the best uh, brain surgeon. I could focus on yep. brain surgery and I should just focus on curing cancer or whatever that is, finding perpetual energy, focus on that. And then my money should just go sit and it should just, I shouldn't have to think about it to the point that you made. I agree. And so then I would just ask the average person, wouldn't you or would you rather your money that you've saved today buy you more goods and services in the future or less? 
And I think everybody agrees they would want their money to buy them more goods and services, not less. But through an inflationary system, the money continues to buy us less and less goods and services. And so if we look at what we really want as goods and services, the money is a proxy of that, so a, a medium of exchange for that. So we have all the wealth of the world, all the goods and services of the world, divided by the money. And if we're trying to keep the money at one, uh, then all the value goes to the goods and services, so everything gets more expensive. But if we had a fixed money supply, then the value could accrue to the money and the goods and services would go down. Am I seeing that right? In theory. In theory, yes. But the problem is it leads to all these similar boom bust cycles. But not if we where, not if we don't Sure, it in, looks good in, in terms of prices, but what happens when everybody's thrown out of work? That's really the issue here is that yeah, okay, so my money buys me more on the other side of a crisis, but I also don't have a job today. So that's not a really good trade-off by any stretch of the yeah. imagination, particularly when those who are thrown out of the work are the most vulnerable in society. And you do that enough times and then you end up with what we're seeing now, which is increasing uh, discontent, extremism, mm -hmm. and anarchy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to your point, we don't, we don't know. We don't have a, uh, we, we don't have an AB test to really run. Although we do have 5,000 years of history without a fiat money system. So we do kind of have that. And to your point, there are booms and busts because cycles change, creative destruction happens. Uh, but we don't have the massive amount of misallocation that we would have today. Um, but again, we don't really have that. I guess what I would say then is um, what problems would a Bitcoin underwritten capital market need to solve in order to be viable in your mind? Well, first of all, it has to have a wide enough base so it's wide enough. It could be used in a wide, widespread. Uh, it needs to be. That's really what a global reserve currency is. And that's what we're talking about, right, Mark? You look at it, Bitcoin, not just for a niche use. You want it to be a medium of exchange, not just a store of value, but a medium, of, a useful medium of exchange that can be used in enough places that it becomes a useful medium of exchange. So it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy there. That's what a global reserve currency actually means. It means it's available, freely usable, and widely used in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, as many places and as many circumstances as it could possibly do. And a fixed monetary system makes that incredibly difficult, especially when it's not widely distributed. And let's face it, money, money is always going to pool. It's always going to tend up. It's always going to end up in fewer and fewer hands because that's how free market capitalism works. Successful people are going to end up with more money in their hands. And what ends up happening in that situation is you need some form of financialization to get that money moving back into the real economy. So you can't escape financialization unless you're willing to go back to a completely 100% commodity physically owned system or the digital equivalent of that, which means you're actually reducing the potential of that economic system. So Bitcoin, I think, has a couple problems, including what happens when it's hoarded, as well as is there enough of it to be used in a widely, uh, widely used across enough places in the real economy. And of course, geography is another part of another yeah. issue as well. So a couple of things. So one, to your point, sure, it has to be widely accepted, right? So money has to have a bunch of attributes, five of them that I really like to key on. But one of them, of course, is saleable, right? You know, recognizable people have to be willing to take it. And so to your point today, right? I mean, it's, it's very small, but we're a, a dozen years into it. So I, I believe money is like an evolution. If we look through the history of money, it's evolutionary, it's emergent, right? So uh, we use rocks and feathers and seashells and all these things. Uh, but one emerged as the best because it had the best money Money properties um, and so I think you know there's like a store like a collectible oh this is kind of cool like I'll hang on to this feather this rock and then eventually maybe that collectible maybe evolves into a store of value so we see the wealth holding fine art and cars and things like that but those don't have money attributes and so maybe a store of value could then evolve to a, a medium of exchange uh, and I'm, I'm happy to admit that I don't think Bitcoin is the best medium of exchange today. It's certainly too volatile to be paying your bills with on a monthly basis. And, and it hasn't reached that wide scale adoption to your point. So I think there's an evolutionary path, um, but it does have the attributes, I think, for it. The one thing I would just point out, and, and I'm sure you're probably aware, but uh, you know, one, one of the many uh, things with Bitcoin is that it's the first, uh, first asset, the first commodity that doesn't need debt to reach velocity. Right. So gold is very slow. Right. It's not portable. I can't send it to England very fast or, or over over Zoom to you right now. And so we had to add the debt on top of it in order to get the velocity. But Bitcoin has velocity with a bare instrument, which is which is pretty interesting. Uh, but anyway, so back to the question. So I guess t I, you, you answered my question. So the, what it would need to solve was it would need to be more widely accepted, I guess, was the point. Uh, 
more, more widely, widely usable. usable. And and me- usable meaning more people are able to use it, right? It's yeah. it's friendly enough and easy enough. Yeah, and not just the more people uh, people in all kinds all types of use cases. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, now let's jump back to the final uh, discussion here that you had set up earlier. It wasn't on my list of questions, but you talked about you know maybe or I'm framing it up as as this end game. So you said the yield curves are predict, predicting that you know there's probably one more pivot in front of us. That's where they're really worried. Um, you had said that maybe there's a few rate hikes before something breaks. Um, I don't know if you had said or maybe this is where I think, but probably before the end of this year we'll probably see that. Um, before something breaks and then they reverse course, we don't know what that is. We can only speculate. What would you? What do you think is the base case of speculation? I know we're only talking in terms of probabilities here. Um, the credit markets dry up, or what do you? What do you see there? Yeah, there's a lot of potential p- potential sparks or potential shocks that we could go through. I think we already did when oil prices skyrocketed in early March. I think that was the trigger for what we're seeing in terms of a base case recession. So the first half of the year, technical recession, as you said, Mark, that's 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 completely a distraction. That's not re- really markets are not worried about what's already happened. They're worried about what's coming next. And what's coming next looks like okay, we start with a recession, but there are also any number of problems from geopolitics to money itself. A big part of the monetary system is repo and collateralized transactions and derivatives, things like currency swaps. And believe it or not, there's just not enough collect- good quality collateral to go around. And so we get into these situations where dealers in particular become risk averse, certain junk quality collateral becomes less negotiable. It acts every bit as if a monetary system was being tightened from the inside. And so I think one of the things that is is forcing these curves to be as, as inverted as they are is concerns about a collateral run as we saw in March of 2020 and again in 2007 and 2008 because We've been stuck in this collateral shortage situation for the last 15 years, and it has never really been handled. And it, is le- it leaves the system, I mean the global financial system as well as the economy, in a precarious situation when it becomes, you know, when we get into these risk averse situations where collateral becomes scarce. So I think collateral shortages, which are prominent in every marketplace that we see, especially you know, something like treasury bills, repo fails. And again, the US dollar skyrocketing. Why is it going up? Because there's problems in the, in the collateral system. That's part of what's going on. And then um, the other part of it is something like geopolitics. What if the Russians do yeah. turn off gas to Europe <laughs> Looks like in they the are. wintertime? Yeah. What is yeah. that going to look like for the world? I mean, that's something that I, if I was you know, running a massive portfolio of hundreds and hundreds of billions, I would probably want to hedge against something like that happening. Or not just gas to Europe. How about food to the Middle East? I mean, so there's any number of real potential shocks that could make a already bad situation worse. And I think that's really the issue here is that we're, we're, we're heading into the second half of this year, all sorts of potential concerns in front of us, and we're starting off the second half of the year on the wrong right. foot anyway. So, I mean, I can understand why curves are priced the way they are in ways that we haven't seen since 2008, because the risks as well as the reality are that mm. unappealing. Yeah. And, and you, you highlighted a number of those, and we have even more. There's all types of uh, landmines out there that could that could blow up on us. So, um, now I guess the the last question we'll just kind of end it with, and this maybe is not a big one, but if the Fed has no control, uh, the euro dollar market is 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 much bigger. Um, let's say that we have this, uh, you know, they they end they end up. Uh, with a few more rate hikes, they they, they stop. Uh, we have any of these uh, significant events that could happen to the point you said with the, the food crisis, the energy crisis, those are two big looming ones of another potential pandemic lockdown that it seems to be rearing its head again, potentially. Um, then the Fed would have to reverse its course and would try to do something, which to your point, maybe they can't. But if it was whatever, 700 billion in 2008, it was six, seven trillion in 2020. I mean, is the next one 10, 20 trillion? And will that have any effect? Can they even keep the bubble from deleveraging? I think the next one is, I think that what the Fed will look at is not so much size, uh, sort of take a a playbook because everybody follows the Bank of Japan anyway. I think what they do is they take a page out of the Bank of Japan's book where they say, okay, we've bought treasuries, we've bought NBS in the past. That didn't really have much of an effect. Maybe this time we're going to actually buy corporate bonds. I know they, they pretended to in, to in 2020. They didn't actually buy many. 
They'll actually buy corporate bonds. They'll start buying ETFs. They'll start buying different asset classes because this is all about psychology. This is all about trying to shock the system in ways that the Fed wants the system to be shocked. So I think rather than rather than seeing an uh, increase in size of quantitative easing, you'll see like Japan where they'll it, they'll add to the target uh, the list of targets for mm. asset purchases. Okay. All right. More strategic. All right. Well, Jeff, uh, it's been an amazing interview. Uh, or, or just, again, just like Volker, <laughs> throwing something against the wall and hoping yeah, it, yeah. It, it works. Well, uh, man, there's so much more we could go on with, but we, we've gone super long. I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, to, to everyone listening, we had some, uh, some frustrations with my, on my end on the recording, so I appreciate your patience with that, Jeff. Um, I know you do the Euro Dollar University podcast, which I listen to, and uh, I recommend everybody check that out. We'll link to that below. MarketsInsiderPro.com and portfolio, PortfolioShield.net, I believe, are two other projects you're working on. We'll link to those. Um, anything else that you want to call out? I, I, I write it at different places, too. Real Clear Markets, Epic Times. So, you know, you can find the research anywhere around the research, writing, commentary. Yeah, all you are all the over the Internet right now. And it's never been... Uh, <laughs> been more important to understand how that works so anyway jeff we'll go ahead and end it with that thanks so much for uh for coming on today my pleasure mark thanks for the invitation right. i really appreciate it all right that's a wrap thanks for listening to this interview with jeff snyder we covered a lot of topics uh, a lot of topics that are maybe eh, not so much conspiratorial or controversial but definitely outside the mainstream view the volcker myth the fed has no control do you agree i'd love to hear your input down below of course, check him out, Jeff Snyder, at the Euro Dollar University podcast. We'll have all his links down below. As always, give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Hit that subscribe button and the bell notifications to know when we put new videos out. And that's what I got for you today. All right, to your success. I'm out. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably going to really like this video right here and this video right here.